Major funding for these programs is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, Capital One Bank, Geneva Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, The Wickoff Group, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of American Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, Colliers International New York City, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG Partners, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grubb Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, Popular Community Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJB Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and These Friends. So they have these young ladies, they grow up in Brooklyn, the Midwood section of Brooklyn. They then become school teachers, then they become community activists, then they become involved with public relations, and then they become the publisher of a newspaper called the Queen's Curry and 17 other publications. I'm very lucky to have the founder, the CEO, the publisher, Vicki Schnapps of Jim Schnapps Communications. Well, Thanks thank for being you. here. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So let's talk a, a little bit about mommy and daddy because you, you, your parents were, were, were interesting people. Tell me about your grandparents a little bit and then we'll talk about your parents. Well, you know, there's this Russian thing that... Uh, Kiev? Kiev, Kiev. Uh, a little furs, right? A didn't shettle, you? but a good-looking shettle that right. my mother tells me that her family were the furriers to the czar. Okay, that's, that's, that was mom's side, okay? Right. And, that, and they also were the educated ones. Those were the Kronbergs? No, no, the Kronbergs was my father's side, oh. my father's family. Okay. were brilliant people. And in the height of the Depression, my dad went to college, and he got through it by working right, at Right, but you said your store. father's father was like a peddler, right? Right. Was, but his mother, yes. my father's mother, came from a very educated family, where education was the critical byword. Right. Now... How do your mother and your father meet, okay? The, the educated person and, this, and the son of the peddler, how they meet? But they met, uh, you know, at uh, a shithawk. They met at a matchup. Somebody matched them up. Okay, so they <laughs> met at a matchup, and you said to me, your father, you know, you know, it's like in Brooklyn history. I think you told me there was a, uh, a, you know, a proclamation that Marty Markowitz gave you that your father later on worked with a, a cousin or a relative in a haberdashery store, okay? And, you know, today nobody would know what a haberdashery Isn't store is. that sad? Right, Just, so, you know, you know, haberdashery store would sell shirts, ties. Did he sell slacks? Slacks? Of, no, slacks. Slacks. And, and he had and, a man who, you come in, you got your hems done as you waited. Okay, hems, I mean, people wouldn't even know, you know, you know, <laughs> cufflinks over there. So what happens is y your dad was on Fulton Street. When mm -hmm. Fulton Street was, was Fulton Street. When Fulton Street, and and there was Gage and Tolner, ah. and, and he had his little daughter over there. But it was you and your brother, right? That's okay, right. Uh, and it was B and Marty Adler. That's right. Okay, and uh, so Dad was at 411 Court Street, Fulton, Fulton Street. Street, right near the courts. Right on. The and top. what happened was, since all the courts were over there, people came to your father. And I could never get him to advertise because he said, I don't believe in that. But he, he, <laughs> he had the index card, right? Yeah. He had the little index card, and he kept his sales records on the index card, and he would say, if the weather was good, that's why this week was good, that week was bad, right? Right. So, so you're born, and you grow up originally in the Midwood section of Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. you, you go to what, 
uh, Cunningham. And I went to Cunningham Junior uh, High, High School. School, right. But you said to me you were eight years of age and you were influenced by the school teacher. What was the school teacher's name? Oh, Mrs. Bora. So tell I me why, you, why do you love Mrs. Bora? Well, I guess, you know, she was a very nurturing, wonderfully warm person. So, so this way you decided that you weren't going to be in the haberdashery business <laughs> right. well, with, with, uh, with your mother and father. Your mother wasn't there no, anyway. No, my father's business. With your father's business, okay, and you used to go down there, but really to go to Oh, I home. was his best salesperson, he often said. Really? Oh, yes. Well, Eight, we, ten, twelve. When it was Christmas, I was there selling. He says, oh, he says, nobody's like you, Vic. Okay, so you, you're, you're helping out in the business, but you also told me that, you know, you, you enjoyed camp growing up, right? Mm, yeah. And you went to Scar Camp Starlight. Mm -hmm. And what was the other? Sycamore? Camp Sycamore, yeah. Okay, and then, and then also on the weekends you would go up to sometimes to Putnam County? We had a house on the lake, Lake Oscawana. Right. Many summers. In fact, I never spent a summer in the city until I got married. Okay. <laughs> so now the, the person who decided that she was going to be a school teacher because of the eighth grade, uh, you graduated high school, you graduated Midwood, Madison. Madison, and you decide to go to, where do you go to college? Vermont? No, nope, I went to the University of Rhode Island. How did you decide in Rhode Island? Well, I don't know how it happened, but I must tell you, it was probably the happiest, most carefree year of my whole life. And what happens at the first year in Rhode Island? Well, I fall in love with this man, this young man who was a jock and who was a letter man and, you know, and a fraternity man. And I lived that whole college scene. And, and what is uh, the, the Adler, you know, what do they say? Well, my parents weren't too happy because he wasn't Jewish. So what happens? So they tell me they can't afford to have me go back. Story, story, <laughs> story, right? But little did I know that I went to NYU instead, which was more expensive so, than Rhode so, Island. So now, now, did you live at home? I lived at home in Rhode Island when I went to NYU. Okay, so you go to NYU, and then you meet Murray? I was introduced by a former sorority sister, yes. Okay, yes. So, you, so you were in a sorority, you meet this guy, and... You get married when? Bef while you're still, still while in college? While I was still in college, I got married and uh, was doing my last year. And he was, at this time, a practicing attorney. attorney. He had just graduated law school. Right. So now you graduate NYU, mm -hmm. and then you get a job as a public school teacher, right? What grade I did loved you? it. What grade? I was a fifth grade teacher and proud of my 10-year-olds. They were wonderful. And which school was this? I was at PS 199, right off um, Avenue M in the Midwood section of Brooklyn. I had actually interned there. And they said I did a good job and they had an opening and so they hired me because they liked the work I did as so, an intern. So where were you and Murray living at this time? We lived in Brooklyn. I was very, I moved a very great distance. My parents lived on East 21st between Quentin and R. And when I got married, we moved on East 21st between Caton and Church. Because I had to be on the BMT line. I had to be near my mommy. Boy, people don't know what the BMT is. No, what do they call okay, it okay. now? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so uh, the F train or the oh, D yes. train. Okay, whatever the train was over there. And then then you also go to Brooklyn College mm. and you go for your master's, right? Yes, yes. Got to make more money. If you have right. a master's degree, you make You made money. $800 more, perhaps. That's right. Uh, so you got the extra 800 bucks. <laughs> and God bless, it was free then. Right, so you, you go to Brooklyn College and you get your master's. And then when you're finishing your master's, what happens? Well, after I finished my master's, it was five years in, in, the, in the making. Right. And finally, after about uh, five years of marriage, I got pregnant. Now, this is a, 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 a double turn on this situation because this is really where you got very involved with community activism. Tell me about uh, your daughter and what happens now. Well, Lara, who was my firstborn daughter, really took me on a whole new path. And it was, Lara was um, born at Brooklyn Jewish and turned blue in the nursery. And when they discharged her, they said that she would be fine. But in fact, she was not fine. You, you told me the story that you had somebody who was a friend and the three month old, you, they, you were comparing Lara to this other one. Yeah, my cousin. And your cousin, right. and, you, and you saw that there was something wrong. Yes, and then the doctor saw her when I went for her three month checkup, her twitting of her eyes, which in turn really was seizures. And from his doctor's office, he sent us to the hospital. And at the hospital, they began the series and we began the journey of tests and what was wrong and why was she having these seizures. And we went from LIJ to NYU to searching out what could help Lara. 
And we found this place that in 1968, when she was born, there were just no places that could help children that had such severe disabilities. And she couldn't speak? She couldn't speak. She couldn't sit up. She was, you know, in diapers. And Willowbrook had an infant rehabilitation so, center So you built. went to Staten Island. Now, Willowbrook had just built this infant. Right. It's a brand new, multi-million dollar building with promises of occupational therapy, physical therapy, just what she needed, and which I couldn't get in the community. It didn't exist. You were living at this time I was Bayside. living in Bayside, right? And I had some wonderful friends. And they said to me when I was taking Lara to Willowbrook and visiting every weekend, they said, Vicki, there, but for the grace of God, go I. How can we help you? And these beautiful ladies helped me form this Women's Organization for Retarded Children, W-O-R-C. And we literally sent busloads of volunteers to Willowbrook every weekend. But, but the more interesting situation was people didn't realize that the governor had cut funds to Willowbrook. Well, right? we, what happened was is that everything was going along smoothly, and, you know, Lara was not progressing, but she seemed well. And when the budget was slashed, which is not dissimilar from when Cuomo has slashed the budget, instantly they cut the staff who were the direct care workers. So someone like Lara that needed total care, they slashed the services of people, the 40 little kids, little babies in the baby buildings, and they slashed it to two staff. So some people were going hungry. So I reorganized all my lovely ladies, and we marched and we picketed. But nobody listened until a cub reporter by the name of Geraldo Rivera. Well, at that time, Jerry Rivera. Well, he was Jerry Geraldo. Rivers. He, he right. was. Jerry he Rivers, was. he had just graduated Brooklyn Law That's School. That's right. And he was working for a, a channel, WABC Channel That's 7. right, Eyewitness News. And what happens? And with Geraldo, the passion of his reporting and the kind now, but, but you of got stories. him into you got it him. It wasn't me. It was one of the doctors at Willowbrook, but he was introduced to me, and he used my personal experience with Lara to film me and to ask me what was going on and to use my knowledge about what was affecting Lara because what was affecting Lara was affecting fifty four hundred people living there, others as well. So, you know, he just kept coming back and telling the story so and he, telling he, the story. So he basically did the expose. He to, did. And because of his expose, we were able to motivate the Parents Association to file a federal class action lawsuit. And that lawsuit, which we won, changed forever the way people with disabilities are served. Because that allowed the funding to go to group homes and day programs. Right, and from this women's organization, that organization today is a $42 million agency yes. called... Life Work. Life Work over there. But now you're in Queens, living in Bayside. Lara is still at Willowbrook, and you start saying you need a, a program in Queens. Right. So tell me about that. What happened? Well, I wanted to find a place for Lara. We had taken her out of Willowbrook when things got bad and began the search for something else that would be appropriate. And when we won the class action lawsuit, funds became available to operate group homes. So we changed the charter from a fundraising charter to an operating charter. And we literally put every dollar we raised into buying a house in Little Neck. Now, isn't that also when uh, Yoko Ono? Oh, well, so Geraldo, I mean, there is nobody like him in the news business today. I, I just admire him so much and appreciate the power of what he brought to us. But at those days, John Lennon was trying to get his immigration visa. And Geraldo convinced him to do a concert Four. at Madison Square Garden to benefit organizations of people who were helping the folks from Willowbrook. And I had the pleasure of meeting John Lennon. But more importantly, we raised a quarter of a million dollars. And the money that we raised from that concert bought the house in Little Neck and enabled us to bring the first children out of Willowbrook into a group home in Queens. So now the school teacher who has become a community activist, what happens next? Well, you know, the group home opened and the, I needed a place for Lara and we kept searching. We found a wonderful building where we had Lara placed. And then I started having more children. I had three more children. And um, I kind of, um, I was president of the board of WRC, but I believe that when you have an organization, you also have to turn the mantle over to others to grow. <laughs> 
And so um, after being a volunteer for many so, so years. So you meet this guy, Leonard Stavitsky? Uh, right. I met Assemblyman. He was an Assemblyman, became a state senator. And I said to him, you know, I'd like to work part-time. And he said, um, well, he said, I have a position as community liaison. Would you come work for me? So I did. I went to work for him. And uh, he had his eye so on a seat. What is a community liaison? Uh, uh, holding events in the community for him. Uh, what do they call those today? You know, town hall meetings. So I organized town hall meetings for him. So that so you were his publicist. Was, you know, I guess that might could, could right. We can that. call that right. His PR. You were his entourage. You took out the people. Right. So what happens? Leonard doesn't get the uh, the seat, right? Well, so I met another man called John Toscano, who had started. He took a buyer from the Daily News, started a weekly newspaper called Queens Week, and was running the newspaper out of his house. And he lived in Middle Village, and I lived in Bayside, the other end of the borough. So I said, John, could I come work for you? So he paid me $100 a week, what and I was a reporter. What do you know about publishing? Well, he taught me everything. <laughs> what I knew is I was a writer. I knew my neighborhoods. I knew the people in so the neighborhoods. So he's in Middle Village, and you're in Bay Terrace. Mm -hmm. And you, you start this Bay Terrace newspaper? No. What we did is we started a paper, and we called it the Queen's Courier. And we started in Bayside. Little, oh, the, the, wait, we're skipping because I worked for him. Oh, wait a second. I worked for him. No, with his Queen's Week. And after I worked for him, he was paying me $100 a week, and right. I worked 24-7. Right, that's so when John, you went I to work for Hevesy. So that's when I got the job as Alan Hevesy's press See, secretary. I knew this, but you, you <laughs> forgot. Okay. Oh, God, so, life so is you, a journey. So then you work for Hevesy. So as I worked for Alan Hevesy as his press secretary. And at the same time, people may not know this. You were doing the Alan's thing with the synagogue. Alan's grandfather was the chief rabbi of the Dohani Synagogue in Budapest, Hungary. And the Hungarian Jews in Forest Hills asked Alan to lead a movement to raise money. So now you're working for Alan and you're working for the Hungarian synagogue. Then you find... Then I just, it wasn't working out. And I said to um, John Toscano, I said, you know, I live in Bayside. I see every building has gone co-op. And I believe when people own their apartments or their homes, they care about a community newspaper. And I said, and he said, well, do you think we can sell a few ads? I said, I'll try. I'll go to my hairdresser. I'll go to my, <laughs> you, you know, my realtor. I'll go. And so we started the newspaper in our living rooms. He worked in his house. I worked in my house. And one day a week we met, and we put the whole paper together, and his son delivered it. Right. Is that when you told me that you one time the, the, the plates went wrong? Oh, God. That was on our very first edition. So here it is, 2 o'clock in the morning. And we, years ago, you bring boards to the printer. And, and we were working in Middle Village, and we went over to Long Island City at 2 o'clock in the morning. And I said, we've got to wait to see our first edition off the presses. And they're these enormous presses. And we're standing in the galley there waiting, and I'm looking. And all of a sudden, the first run comes out, and the front page picture is a black blob. So I yelled, stop the presses, stop the presses. And they did. And they had to take the plate off. We went to the car, got the photo, re-shot the photo, remade the plate, put the plate back on the presses. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, I had a perfect paper. So what happens with him? You're with him, your right. partners, but you were making not much money at this time, right? You know, it was, um, to this day, you know, the news business is, you don't get rich at the news business, but you do get enriched. And uh, so, so I decided to buy John out. And This uh, is 1985? Uh, no, this was about 1988, because we were in business together for a few years. And uh, I began the journey on my own, and I hired an editor because he was always my editor. You know, I was kind of so. What was the, you were still running this local one paper, just one paper, Correct. right? Well, we served a few neighborhoods, right? And then how how did it grow? Well, it grew by people coming to us. One man came to me from Southeast Queens says, "We need a newspaper of quality. Could you open a paper for us?" And another gentleman from Astoria came to me and said, "Could you open a newspaper for us?" And it kind of grew organically. And over the years, um, when I saw an opportunity like the growing Spanish community in Queens, we started a Spanish So um, today you have, what, 17 publications? Because we expanded into Brooklyn as well. So I'm, back you, my I'm back to yeah, my now, roots. Now you're back to your roots. Right. Uh, okay, maybe you can go back to Cunningham and you know, <laughs> have a newspaper over there. But, but be back to your roots, now you, you know, being in the publishing business, is a, is a weekly chore, you know, you got to get the press, you know, you look at this over here, I mean, this is, this is over 100 pages. Over, yes. Uh, 
you know, with uh, lots of ads, because without ads, we don't have... It pays we, the bills. We, we, it doesn't pay the bills. But, you know, you, you've progressed, and you've, you've really gone into... So how did you decide to get into Brooklyn? I mean, we, we, there are borders, you know, between the two no, cities. Okay. No. But how do you go to Brooklyn? Well, you know, my son had the opportunity of a broker coming to him and telling him about these papers in Brooklyn. And I said, what do we need it for, Josh? We've got so many publications in Queens. We also are the official paper for the Queens Chamber of Commerce. So I said, uh, I'm not really interested. He said, Mom, wouldn't you come talk to the lawyer? You know it's in Bay Ridge. I said, it's in Bay Ridge. Oh. Nice neighborhood, Bay Ridge, right? I said, OK, I'll listen. And the paper had existed for 75 years. So what's the name of the Brooklyn publication? Well, we've got two. Well, we've got three, but it's called the Brooklyn Home Reporter and the Brooklyn Spectator. So we serve the whole southwestern part of uh, and the western part of the borough. Now, these are weeklies? Weeklies. So you, how many weeklies do you have right now? Ten. So you have ten weeklies. Right. The Spanish is weekly also? Bi-weekly. So the, the Spanish is bi-weekly. Right. And then you bought a, a, a magazine called, called Borough. Borough Magazine. Now tell me what that Borough is. That comes out is. once a month. And that's a where to go, what to do publication from each the Sunnyside, Long Island City, and Astoria communities. And then we own another magazine called the Long Island City Courier, which is a kind of very trendy magazine that sits the is that a magazine? people in Long Island City. That's a magazine once a month as well. Okay. And then Josh, who's your son, right. one, of, one of your, you have three children, right? Yes. Okay. So Josh got involved. Josh was in investment banking, right? Yes. So what happens? He calls mom up one day. Tell me <laughs> the story. He called me one night and he said, mom, if I'm going to work so hard, could I come and work for you? And he was doing so well that I had to take a salary cut in order to afford to have him come to work for me. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me. My son and I just have the same kind of understanding and rhythm, and his, he's got the same, we call it Mishigas craziness that I have, that we're always working to create new things. So Josh came to me about 10 years ago, and it's been a blessing and an expansion of our visibility, and then, of course, the whole social networking world. You know, we have so a now website, you know, we have so you online. So you know what Facebook is, you know what Twitter is? <laughs> we're Twitter, is. we're uh, Facebook, we're online, we got it all going for us. So tell me, you know, be, besides all this, then, you know, an entrepreneur is always an entrepreneur. You got involved with uh, the... Uh, uh, the flea market. How how'd you get <laughs> involved in a in a flea market? I mean, you know, when I was living in New Jersey, there was the the, the oh, English Town flea yes. market. Okay, you know where you get the tie dye shirts and all the all the rest. But flea markets in Long Island City. Talk to me about that. Well, Josh lives in Williamsburg, and for years he was watching over his window on the 29th floor the Brooklyn flea market. Does he live at the edge? He lives next door. And they had the flea market actually on Jeff Levine's property. So the edge was um, mobbed with people on the weekends going to this flea market. So Josh said, Mom, why can't we do that in Long Island City? So I said, well, I don't know why not. Why not? So, so I went to a friend of mine who's on the board of the Queens Museum with me, um, and Andrew Kirby, and uh, his family, the Plaxalls, own five acres on the waterfront in Long Island City. And TF Cornerstone has built these magnificent 45-story apartment buildings. And we have using the parking lot from one of Andrew Kirby's properties right on 5th Street. So, so every Saturday and Sunday, people every can Saturday go out and to, Sunday, to thousands LIC. of people come to us. So they go to LIC Fleet. <laughs> right. And, right. And to keep it in the family, your daughter's involved with that. I, my daughter is vetting the vendors. And your daughter's name is what? Elizabeth. Okay, so Elizabeth over there is, is, is she, what do you mean she's vetting the vendors? Well, when we uh, publicized, because we publicized through all of our newspapers and our website and our social media, we got 2,000 people who applied to come and be vendors. And we could only handle 80 each day. So her job is to meet the vendors and make sure the quality so what, is wait, of a what, great so Tell level. me, what type of vendors do you have there? Oh, it's very dangerous because I shop till I drop. <laughs> the vendors are so great. So we have vendors, first of all, the food vendors. We have one man who stays overnight and makes the brisket. We have another wonderful restaurant that has a brick oven pizza. They bring the oven right to the flea market. We have another vendor who has on a bicycle, an ice maker. On the bicycle, he shaves the ice for ices. So you get freshly iced ices with flavors. Uh, then we have these wonderful vintage 
people. Uh, we even had the Long Island, uh, this um, Lara Spencer is doing a um, film at the flea market. It's going to be on television, A Day at the Flea. And she does this concert, so, so she came to us and filmed so, it at our so flea market. So in addition to that, I mean, since you're not too busy, you're also on Brooklyn Public TV, aren't you? Tell me about that. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, in Brooklyn, there are fabulous people. Like, I met you. There are fabulous people wherever I go. And in Brooklyn, we we're blessed to uh, have that great TV there, and we're able to do some shows. And I call it, um, what do I call it? I call it Victoria's Stars. Victoria Stars. And and then, then you decided that since there was not enough time in the day that you also have gone into the the, the seminar business, right? And the Well, we do events. Events. So what, what kind of well, events? Well, this started because I was at a chamber dinner. And this chamber dinner had a dais the length of a football field. And I look in from the audience. It was a business awards dinner. And I look at the audience. There was not one woman on the dais. So I said to myself, no, 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 no. I am going to create an event called the Top Women in Business. And we created that event from scratch. And we honor women in business. It's 12 years. We have 800 people coming out to pay so, tribute. So you had, and then, then you, you couldn't be anti-man. Well, the men so, said, so, said so, Vicki, so, what about us? So you have the top men in business. We oh. call them the kings. OK, and so let's talk about the true kings and queens. Let's talk about your children and their grandchildren. Tell me oh, about them. My blessings. My legacy. My real legacy. Uh, well, uh, my baby is Josh. And then a, uh, who's in business, who's in with, business you? with me. And he has a wonderful Hudson, who's one year old, and a lovely wife, Tracy. And then we have Samantha. And who's Samantha, your daughter? My daughter. And uh, she um, is a Columbia graduate social work. And she has these magnificent two children, a boy and a girl, my Blake and uh, Morgan. And then Elizabeth has these beautiful two children who are now living with me and who I adore every morning when they come and scream, Mama, Grandma, Grandma, Grandma. So you have. <laughs> who are four and two, Jonah and Addison. You know, it's, it's been an interesting uh, travels over your many years. You know, this thing called life is a great journey. You just don't even know where it's going to lead you. And I just adore, you know, the opportunity to have met you and to be able to sit here with you today. It's just this rare thing. And if you just go along with the road, you never know where it takes you. And I've been on a very <laughs> bumpy road. <laughs> but thank God it's here. And, and you've done a great job. And I'm overjoyed. I'm so happy you've been here today. And thanks for being on my show. Thank you.